name is Stephen Rafferty, and you're watching These Are Questions. This is the internet show where I ask people questions about things, life, and such not. Today's guest is a musical artist and a musical composer. Please welcome Jessica Muniz Calado. Jessica. Hey, Stephen. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Stephen. It's great to be here. God, I'm, 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 I'm really excited to interview you because we've known each other for quite a while now. And you have such an interesting story. So I definitely want to go over so many different things within your musical career. Um, but before we get into everything, I need to explain the rules of these are questions. Jessica, I'm going to ask you a series of questions that are based around your career and aspirations, along with a mixture of questions that are borderline idiotic and, well, randomly stupid. Do you accept those terms? There's no other way to accept them. I like that. I like that. I like that. I like that answer. Alrighty then. Well, with that, Jessica, are you ready? Yes. Alright. I hear the dog in the background, so I know. definitely ready. It's okay. It's okay. Jessica's dog. dog. Are you ready? Oh, well, she's ready. She's awesome. ready. Look at that. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Internet, are you ready? I'm going to take that as a yes. With that, let's begin. So, you know, I would like to say that you are a world-renowned musical composer. And I know sometimes as artists, you know, sometimes we kind of downplay our amazing creative talents, you know? You don't want to be so much in the limelight. But there's a truth to it. You are a world-renowned musical composer. And you've worked with some of the best musical talents and companies offered on the planet. And that's no joke. Can you dive into and provide more information about your journey and the early beginnings of how everything started for you? Wow, it's a loaded question. So, so uh, uh, what we quote uh, "Sound of Music." Let's start at the very beginning. Very good place to start. <laughs> to start, yes. Uh, so I, um, I grew up in Miami. So that, that's how far back we're gonna go. Okay. So, but there's a purpose. So um, I was. Born in Miami, I was the first, um, uh, um, my parents are immigrants, and so I was the first born, well, not the first, I have an older brother, but I was the first female in my family to be born here in the United States. Um, very, very humble beginnings. No shame in saying my first home was in a trailer, it was in a trailer park. Oh, wow. And uh, that's kind of, you know, I grew up in in Hylia, which a lot of people <laughs> have their pros and cons. If, those who know Miami, they're like, oh my gosh, she's from Hylia. But you know what? I made it. I made it out, right? I, it's all good. But um, I didn't grow up uh, wealthy, and uh, but I didn't grow up either thinking that I was a victim or oppressed at all. I grew up with um, a mindset of because we're here in America, we have more opportunity than we got from where we were. So with that, my mind was always on this. It's going to be hard, but as long as you hustle and understand that slow and steady win the race, you're going to get there. And that's kind of like where I grew up, like always kind of thinking. I didn't actually start music by a lot in, you know, music industry kind of uh, individuals would look at me and say, you probably had a pretty late start. Um, 12 years old, I picked up a pair of drumsticks uh, in middle school band program because my brother was in band, he's older, and he played the trumpet and I went to one of his band events and I saw the drum line and I said, oh my gosh, that's the coolest thing in the world, I want to learn how to play the drums. So with that, you know, I did everything I could to, to learn. And mind you, I grew up with no... Uh, YouTube the way it is now, no social media, no freebies. You know, it was kind of like you just got to kind of learn and absorb what you can. Um, and because of that, you also had more time to practice because your mind wasn't. I mean, we have more time to practice now, but you weren't as distracted being a middle schooler. And uh, so I just kind of really, really practiced. And um, with that, I was able to do certain, you know, competitions and events. And that just kind of really fueled my passion for music. Uh, but there was a lot of things that I did miss out on um, because of, uh, you know, financial and socioeconomic status. And again, I never, I was like, man, that kind of sucks. I can't do that or I can't be a part of that or whatever. But I said, well, I'm not going to 
live in this mindset right now of, well, because I can't do that, it's all over. It's like, no, I'll find another way. I'm just going to keep growing, keep practicing, keep moving my way up. Um, it wasn't until I was 16 years old that I realized I wanted to make music my life's, you know, goal. I wanted this to be my career, but I didn't know what I wanted to do specifically with it. At the time, all I knew was I just want to play drums. That's it. I don't know what it's going to do for me because, again, I didn't have the, the right training. I didn't have um, private lessons at that time. Even at 16, I didn't have them. Um, and I didn't know... A, what my options really were but i sought them out whatever i could to seek them out that's kind of what drove me it's like if i wanted to do this i need to figure this out so um i made the the decision in my mind that i wanted to go to the university of miami frost school of music and i remember when i was telling my parents like i want to be a musician that's what i want to study in college they just looked at me and said good for you we support you um but we can't pay for it we don't know anything about college, like how to help you. But um, if you go to college, you could live here in the meantime. If you don't go to college, you're not living here for free. <laughs> you know, it was one of those, you got to do something, right? Yeah. So again, always had that like, and my parents love me. We have a great relationship, but I'm glad they raised me with that mindset of, of you, you got to hustle. You got you to gotta work hard and you just got to tune out all the negativity around you and just keep pushing forward. So um, it I pursued a percussion performance degree, which is basically you learn everything there is about the world of percussion. And I, and I did drum set a bit while I was there. And I just thought in my mind, I go, I, I want to be a performer. And I had great opportunities, you know, as a performer, um, I got to go to uh, Japan and do a tour there for two weeks with some other incredible artists too, from, from University of Miami and um, great musicians today. One of them is actually a, uh, toured with um, Childish Gambino now, Danny Markham, percussionist and um, really good friend and just um, a great resource to have too, you know, in, in the industry and really helpful. Uh, she's actually talked to my students at Nova, come and, you know, really connected with them. But anyway, um, during my touring, I got to go to South America for some time and did some stuff with uh, missions down there and I got to perform, did some stuff in the U.S. But I was more, um, I saw myself leaning more toward composition and I really, I noticed I'd be in the practice room and instead of practicing what I needed to practice, I started getting a, like my mind would wander somewhere else and be like, well, this is a nice chord progression, but what happens if it went here or what happens if it went here? And then I'm like, oh man, you know, I think I want to do composition. So I saved that. I got good advice as an undergrad, my, my advisor at the time who was um, also my percussion mentor, he said, uh, Ney Rosaro, who I study with, is an incredible artist, those in the percussion community, if they watch his videos, they'll know exactly who he is. Um, but he said, um, finish out your percussion performance and then do uh, your graduate work in composition. So that's what I did. Did graduate work, composition, and then even as I was studying composition, I wasn't 100% sure what area of composition I wanted to go into. I just said, I, I want to write music. How do I do it? So... I try to say this as a as a comfort, not even to downplay of like some people may think, wow, you know, like, how did you not know that? How did you not know what you want to know? I'm being honest. I didn't know, but I wanted to seek it out. I really do consider myself a lifelong learner. And it doesn't matter how old you are, if the day you stop learning and wanting to seek out new things and learn is the first day you begin to die. That was told to me one time and I go, it makes a lot of sense. So. Uh, I went to graduate school, Vermont College of Fine Arts, and I got to study a jazz composition because I did have um, a, a really like passion for not just jazz, what we hear, you know, like big band or things like that, but I really enjoyed Brazilian jazz. I really enjoyed Latin jazz. Um, I loved funk and I just loved all the harmonies, how they're put together. And as a percussionist, that was one of my weaknesses because I work on rhythm and this is more... Um, harmony based. So I was already able to identify my weakness and not be ashamed of it, but it's like, okay, I'm weak at this. By me identifying my weakness is a form of strength because I want to go and get better at it. So I studied jazz composition. And then during that time, I actually got my first film scoring gig. It was a nature documentary. And that was kind of like, I really like this uh, film scoring stuff. So then I got another documentary 
And then I started shifting my focus towards scoring for media. And in uh, 2013, 2014, one of those years, um, I got my first... I got my first big network gig with uh, Mundo Fox, which was a Spanish, ne- the Spanish branch of the Fox Network. And the show was called Los Golden Boys. It was produced by Oscar de la Hoya, championship boxer, and Mario Lopez, aka okay, Slater, right? Yeah. By the bell. Yeah. So uh, that was really cool, you know, hearing from the music supervisor. Um, and it was like, hey, you know, we want you to make tracks for the show. So it was like, oh my gosh, like this is, this is great. And so I was, during that time, it was like, okay, this is the technology you need to do. Now you need to work with the Digital Audio Workstation. And it's like, okay, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll learn how to do that. And so as I'm like learning and I have like my tutorial books and I have teachers and references as I'm creating the score for the show. So um, not only am I applying what I'm learning comp- in composition, I'm, I'm actually learning a new um, format of writing at the same time. And again, very late bloomer 2013 that's you know not even 10 years ago really I, I had my first DAW like really good deep experience with it I knew what they were but I never experienced you know work ex- had experience working with them um, but I just dove right in and learned everything I could about it and then um, that show I ended up doing about 100 tracks for that show wow. so that was that was a lot of work the turnover time was just very quick um, I will say the thing with media, when you're working um, in certain networks, is that you don't get a lot of screen credit. You get paid, you get, you know, your music's out there, um, but you don't really get the credit sometimes. So that's just kind of like a little tip if anyone's interested. Like, I want to do this and I want to get the credit. I have credits on other in films and, and things like that. But sometimes when you do a show, you may not get the credit because it's kind of... Um, your music was just sought out, put in the show, but you're not going to appear there on the screen, which yeah. it was fine for me because it was my first gig. I was like, how picky can I get? <laughs> you know? And with that gig, got another gig and then another film. Um, I've had, I was fortunate to work with, um, there was an IMAX conservation project by a group of filmmakers doing an ocean conservation film and IMAX was the supporter for that. So that was pretty cool. Um, then I started kind of, I did, you know, shorter films, independent films. Um, one of them was a lot of fun. Um, it was called uh, Three Shirts and Abroad. Actually, it was an award winner at the Madrid Film Festival. And uh, when you hear it, you know, it came across my, my email. I said, Three Shirts and Abroad. And I'm like, is this a porno email? Like, oh, what is about to come across my screen? You know, and so I go and I click on it and it was... The director asking if I wanted to score this film and ironically it was about a guy who is a hardcore Catholic who um, he's a producer loses his job in a production company and the only job he can get to support his family is producing a porno but oh. he never goes the, the only way is that he never goes down on set so he's like I'm not gonna go down it kind of reminded me of a Woody Allen flick that's funny um, but it was it was really funny. They won some awards for that, so I was really happy for them. And then that you know opened up another smaller opportunity that they were working on for like a web series. And it's just really uh, interesting how people hire you back not not just because of your work, but like the connection you make with them and the relationship you have. And that's kind of a lot of the stuff I've gotten was just like word of mouth. You know, go to Jessica. You know, here and during this time, I'm still learning new things, trying to stay ahead of the next big wave. Um, you had podcasts blowing up. Okay, let's do this. Let's do that. But then I, you know, I, I also wanted to focus on um, other mediums. So it wasn't just media, but um, when I started working at Nova as an assistant professor, it was one of these things where now I have an opportunity to compose for film. I mean, not film, a theater yeah. and dance. And like, what is what are these mediums like? So one project led to, you know, small theater production to the Florida Breast Cancer Association funding this theater project to promote breast cancer awareness. So it's like, hey, that's, that's a pretty big deal. It's a big organization, you know, and to be able to work on that. Um, so that's kind of like where I am now. You know, not only am I just teaching, I enjoy teaching because I truly believe that 
this next generation of students, like it's, it's going to be hard, but easy at the same time. And in, I like investing my time into their lives to make sure that they are prepared because it is a cutthroat, ruthless industry, regardless of what people say, uh, but you can make a living doing it and you can do it with integrity. And that's kind of why I really want to be in, in the classroom setting, just kind of prepare them for this. It's going to be hard, but don't lose your identity and your integrity uh, in the in the process. You know? So during this entire time and, you know, explaining this, um, it's been one of these things. Oh, and just recently, a big win for me was um, uh, I'm a voting uh, member for the Recording Academy. That was a big uh, feat to get to. That took about five years. Wow, congratulations. For, that that's Thank you for that. Accomplishment. So that's, you know, I did my first voting and I was like, yeah, all right, this is cool, you know, and because you want to see, you know, other artists um, that have good quality out there, you know, that help give them a chance and really pay attention and hear their you know their work and if i have the option and you know the time to sit there and, and make the time to really give them a shot okay what's coming across my headphones how well is it put together and everything like that i'm going to want to do and I, I heard some incredible incredible music come across i was really surprised but hey sixty thousand tracks get uploaded to spotify every day so the numbers are just going to get higher and higher with the amount of work that's going to come across um, our streaming services. So I think I just rambled and I lost track there. No, I was no, saying, no. But yeah, things are good now. <laughs> I started a business, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad. No, no, no. I think it's not rambling because you've done so many different things and you're continuing to pursue other endeavors within not just music fields per se, but just in different media avenues. And it shows a lot of your creativity and also your adaptability to pursue a lot of different endeavors to see, okay, maybe this will work and how can I apply it with music and vice versa? Or how can I help someone that's up and coming? What knowledge can I provide? So no, 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 it's not rambling at all. It's just showing how amazing your career has been so far. And I think it should be addressed. It should be, it should be, you know, promoted. It should be shown because it's amazing. You know, in, in my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> what I'm here for. And, um, you know, you kind of dabbled a little bit uh, on the, you know, the process of creating music, but I wanted to go a little bit further. And can you explain to me the steps of composing a new track? You know, what is your thought process when you're conducting new music? How do you kind of set the tone mm -hmm. for uh, a new musical piece or a new composition piece? So it, it depends on what I'm hired to do. Okay. If I'm writing for me and just for me, which it's been a while, <laughs> but you know, I still do. I still do like things. I'm working on some stuff now that I just really want to put out. I am very um, rhythmically driven mm -hmm. because I'm a percussionist and I don't want to say percussion driven. I don't want people to think, oh, well, then she has like a lot of heavy drums or things. I go, no, no, no I'm, I'm rhythmically driven. So I hear usually a rhythm in my head first. And then from there is my start. Where do I want this rhythm to go? How do I want it to evolve? And then I add usually a, a bass line. And then from there I go and I add um, a chord progression and then a melody. And that's, that's my process usually in that way. But sometimes if I'm hired for like film or a theater project or something like that, I have to ask the director questions on really what it is that they're seeking because they may say, I want it to be as ambient and scarce as, and very just like light and very synthy as possible. And it's okay. Well then my ideas of rhythm, I have to put them aside because I have to listen. So it really is letting the director guide me um i've worked with directors before who they'll say um just do whatever you're, whatever you feel and that's a good and a bad thing because what i feel in that moment and and i'm living in this work your mind as a director is going on to other things it's going on to the editing the actors the direct you know so many other things your mind so at that moment you just said i don't care do what you want but 
now I'm taking my time to actually sit there and analyze and trying to give your work the best attention as possible musically. Um, then I give it to the director and they're like, well, that's not what I wanted. Yeah. It's kind of like, and then you know what? But I have to remember that I was invited along this, this whole process. It's not my project, it's theirs. And I was invited to participate. So we have a, a saying where we dance with the picture. It's kind of like what we do. It's like our job as direct as composers to dance with the picture. But then we also have, they say the dance could mean, um, you know, what's your fee? What's your budget? You know, that dance too, of <laughs> like how much you're going to get paid. Right. So, you know, some of them call it the standoff. You know, okay. It's like, but again, I usually, I've been fortunate to have worked with a lot of directors who, again, they were either recommended or someone, you know, I've had, uh, very um a small history with them in the past i've worked with some directors that i've never met before in my life and now i have a history with them yeah. but it's it's one of those things where be respectful be professional don't take offense to anything um you can defend your work but no one's gonna love it as much as you so you have to understand that if someone says i don't like it and they can't explain why they don't like it it is your job to kind of help them out and if they're still not getting it then you have to start from scratch all over again it's it's all it's all a part of the collaboration process yeah. within all these different uh individuals and they're all trying to get mm -hmm. to the same goal give or take but you know everyone has their own vision of that same goal you know so it can be it can be quite tricky at times but it's all part of the process yeah, it is fun. I mean, I've worked on projects um, where I've given them, you know, I worked, this was a particular um, commercial. Ad. It was actually a Super Bowl commercial. Okay. It came out, it was a few years ago. And um, I worked on this project. I got all the way up to the end. So the final, final, like it was my track and another track for this. Okay, so like, head on. Yeah, I mean, it was like right there. Oh, okay, and, okay. Um, and the turnover window for this was something like 48 hours, the first round. So I got contacted and it's like, hey, can you pitch, can you put something together, pitch the first round and then, then they came back, okay, make this tweak, make this tweak, whatever, make the tweaks. Turns out I get to the end and then they actually didn't even go with the original idea they wanted. Like, oh, so wow. all the talk of what they wanted. So it was one of those like, you know, I, I watched the commercial because things kind of went silent for a yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. And then I was like, what happened? What's going on? And then I, I actually see the commercial on the Super Bowl. And I don't, um, I, I realized like, wow, the music, like they didn't, they went totally opposite yeah. of what it is that they wanted. And it turns out that um, that can happen. Their ideas shift. And so it's not a reflection of saying I made a bad track. In fact, I still got paid for the project. Well, that's good. You know, yeah, it's, it's still good, you know, but it would have been nice to have the, the spot. But it wasn't, you know, what they wanted was completely different than what was actually put out as a final project. So I can't take that personal. It's like, hey, it was fun, you know, putting the track together. Now I just have another piece. I always look at it as it's never a loss because I still walk away with a piece of music that I own. I created something. I own it. Someone's going to use it sooner or later. So go. that's just kind of how I look at it. So I just have stacks of tracks just. My library is like, okay, that worked. They didn't want it. All right, I keep it. Now I have something else. I have something else. You, you're locked in, ready to go for when the next opportunity comes in, and you'd be like, boom, I got it right here. You need this track, got it right here. You know? Yeah, that's yeah. really how it works. Absolutely. Okay, my next question is mm -hmm. um, Do you know how to write in cursive? I do. Good, because a lot of people do. don't. <laughs> I do. They don't, they're, they're, not, they're not teaching it anymore, apparently. Like now it's just, it's just all print and it's like, curse is really nice when you know how to write it. I, I, I do have a problem writing just regular print though. It's okay. just, I, I write in small caps. Like, look, even in my slogans, everything's like capital letters. So it always looks yeah. like I'm screaming. I'm not screaming. No, you're not. This is not, this is not a threat <laughs> or anything. I don't know. It's just, it's just how we write. It's just how we write. That's all. Just, just the way it is. It's just the way it is. But I'm glad. I'm glad you know how to write in cursive. Yes. Um, which kind of, well, it doesn't lead to my next question, but I'm going to say my next question anyway. Um, could you be able to play a game of dominoes, but instead of dominoes, the pieces are dominoes pizza slices? Wow. Very deep question. It's kind of a domino okay. effect. 
So, so what are the rules? You see, because what if, is this a pepperoni Domino's pizza? Well, it, because if that's the case, then what I can do is like, what if I need a three? Like, can I just eat the pepperonis and so, you know, you know what I mean? The slices are random. You could get a pepperoni slice with, you know, maybe oh. two or three pepperonis. You could get like a, 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 a veggie with like some green peppers, some tomato, you know? You could have a supreme where you have all the toppings and that's like maybe six and six each. That's like a 12 piece right there. Um, you know, that's or you could true. get a cheese where it's just no, it's just nothing. It's just, it's no, there's no toppings. You, that would just, be a rough hand. Uh, like all cheese pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My next question would be, um, I would like for you just to talk to me a little bit about your business, um, uh, Nisco the creation of it, and how do you help inspiring musicians and composers reach their musical goals? Yeah, so Nisco started out uh, really, it, it took off, I would say, during the pandemic. So the, the idea was there, it kind of connects back to my years of teaching, you know, it's, I've always had this desire to want to help, uh, again, the next generation of, of music students. Um, but during the pandemic, you know, everybody's world changed. And so you start seeing musicians, you know, they're like, what do I do now? Especially the ones who don't know the tech and, and their whole life is performance live. And now you can't perform live. How are you supposed to make a living? So since I had more time on my hand, like many of us did, I conducted a survey and I sent a survey out to about 2000 musicians. And I just reached out on all these different social media platforms. And I just said, tell me what you wish you knew or something that could help you, you know, along the way. Like, man, if I, if I would have known this, it would have helped me in this. If I would have known this, whatever. So when I got all that information back, I was just really looking through it. And then I was taking my personal experiences as well and, and kind of putting it in there. And I developed these four pillars that it just happened to work perfectly in creating the acronym of BEAT. And as a drummer, of course, you know, I have a bias, so I have to connect it. Yeah. But B stands for a uh, business education, artist development, and technology. A lot of musicians, they learn the training. I learn the training a lot. I, I, I'm confident on my um, instrumental approach. I know, you know how to do very specific things on, when, when it comes to percussion because I devoted so many hours and years into perfecting this. But I didn't know how to monetize it. Like, it was never really taught to me. So... A lot of musicians, they know their instrument, they know their craft, but then they don't know the business side of it. And then this is how you get bad deals. People get excited, they get too emotional when they, if they get a record deal or, or a publishing contract, and then they ended up getting screwed. But if they only knew knowledge in, in a certain area, they could have you know, said been a little more um, reserved about jumping on the first deal that came their way. Education side of it too is, well, um, a lot of people, maybe there's certain areas where, not saying that you have to go to college or, or get a degree in a specific area, which it's not a bad thing to do, but it's learning, you know, con continually educating yourself with uh, what's going on with the industry, what are the trends, and, and learning where to look and how to connect with people that, you have to be honest, that know more than you in a certain area. Um, artist development, a lot of musicians, they don't know how to really establish their voice in, as an artist because society says, this is how you have to go. The music industry says, this is where you have to go. And if you're not in these areas, you're not going to make it. And if that's not true. There's an audience for everybody, but you can't find that audience first, unless you know where, where you stand as an artist. So, um, I'll be honest, one of the biggest, uh, genres that I love, uh, and when I say write or produce, and this is my personal stuff that I like to write, even though I have my feet in both worlds and the classical world and the commercial music world, I've written for both. I've written classical music. I've written percussion literature. I've, but I love writing new disco and future funk that's coming out now and producing track. Like I really, really enjoy it, you know? And for me, I have to ask myself, well, what grounds me in both these areas? And I go back to, rhythm yeah. it's like that's who i am as an artist and my music is rhythmically driven and i know i can always come back to that that is my voice as an artist a lot of musicians they have a hard time establishing that because they're afraid 
if they're not in a particular genre, they're not going to make it. And that's just simply not true. And then the last one is technology. Um, it's always changing. It's always growing. I mean, we can create, produce entire tracks off of our cell phones now. And that's just amazing. I didn't grow up with that. And, you know, it's a big deal. But if you don't know the tech, you know, you're actually kind of putting yourself back. It, it's like I always tell my students, it's like they're trying to write a novel and you only know half the alphabet. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so these four pillars really, when, when you put them together, they help create a sustainable music career. And uh, I've been fortunate to talk about this at conferences. I'm actually going to be talking about another conference in February about this idea, because if we can get this idea in classrooms more, um, even at a younger age, just incorporating it in little, little, you know, innovative ways in curriculum that um, you're really setting up students not to fail or to regret going the path as a musician, yeah. that, that route. Um, hence the, our phrase here, NISCO Music, I do have a, um, a partner that I work with in this business and uh, he was my mentor and he's a real tech guru. His name is Don DiNicola. And we kind of really wanted to make a statement with what it is we do. So our vision at NISCO Music is helping musicians compose their careers to their own beat. And that's what we want to do. So we take calls. Um, I met with so many musicians uh, during COVID and, and this year as well. Just whatever questions they had, you know, we just take like 20, 30 minute calls, no charge for the call, just get them on and just like, what concerns you? And they're like, well, I didn't know about this. I don't know about this. And, you know, what can I do here? And then some of them become clients that they work with and we help guide them. Everything is very customizable to their needs. It's not like you're getting a lecture from me that's out of a textbook or this is what it is, but very specific to what it is they're seeking. And a lot of my clients, really, the ones they're going for are technology and uh, business. Those seem to be the big ones. Um, because through, throughout the way, along the journey, they kind of learn artist development because yeah. they start seeing where they naturally default to with certain sounds, with certain ways of writing. Um, so it just kind of evolves and it's pretty cool to watch that evolution happen with certain artists. But yeah, our business, we, we're, we're doing really well. I'm really happy with it. And we're just open to talking to clients. I mean, there's no shame here. It's like you're talking to someone who just picked up like learned a DAW 10 years ago which I know kids now who like it, it feels like they they turn five and they already know how to run you know garage band or a whole like DJ setup and it's kind of like you are a very fortunate kid you know, to... number one and it, it, it's just sur surreal like how intuitive um, the kids are and where they're coming up, and then even then, when they get older, the next generation is going to come in. Yes. And it's going to be even quicker and faster, and it's going to be yes. a whole different technology. The the one thing that I have seen that I want to stress, yeah. if a younger generation is watching this, um, so I'm a millennial, so anybody millennial and down, right? Um, it's don't rush the process. Slow and steady wins the race, and I want to stress steady. Be consistent in what you do. Just be, you can have multiple ways of making money in the industry, but don't lose your, your anchor. What brings you back to who you are as an artist? Again, going back to integrity, trying to cheat your way through certain things to get to the top because it's your reputation is going to go further than your music. So you, you can have great music, but if you're a terrible person to work with or you're a shady person, they're just, you're not going to get that support that you need. So integrity goes a long way. Your character goes a long way as well. Absolutely. Very wise words there. Mm -hmm. um, um, it kind of leads on since you uh, are, are discussing a lot about educating and teaching um, young minds and also the future uh, generation for uh, musical talent. It kind of goes to my next question. Um, who do you think would be, uh, what do you think would be easier to teach a musical instrument to? Um, Homer from The Simpsons or Peter Griffin from Family Guy? <laughs> oh, man. That's a tough one. 
listen to these are questions. We give you questions. Who teach? Does it matter the instrument? Doesn't matter. It could be any instrument. It could be as, wow. as simple as a triangle or as complex as a as a cello or a violin. You know, so uh, whichever instrument I, is best for you that you can teach either or. You know, I could see. Um, I'm not a vocalist. Uh, as my primary answer, but I could see Peter Griffin being a vocalist with his little ha 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 stuff. I could see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that. And then I could see, um, I think Homer could rock a tambourine. He always has the donuts. <laughs> the donuts. A good little, That's a good name know. for a band. The donuts. the donuts. And it's just an all tam tambourine band. Just tambourines, you know, little little shakers, you know, just yeah. this motion of like putting in the donut in his mouth, I think, you know. Okay. So you could teach both of them. I, I get it. So that, there you go. I, I think you could start. Yeah, you know. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Um, and it kind of goes to my next uh, question, unrelated but related in some shape or form. Um, do you think that the Loch Ness monster could make a good basketball player? Wow. You know, I, th I think we need to cut the Loch Ness monster a break. I think now we're profiling. Bro We're looking at height. Whoa, here. whoa, whoa! But this is these are questions. <laughs> you know, this is not a profiling place. No, no, no. No, it's oh. like it's like, oh, he's tall or it's tall, you know. And you should play basketball, you know. Oh. Kind of just let him be. <laughs> let him be. Just let, <laughs> let him do what he wants. Just he let wants him eat his beef jerky. Make he's making money off of commercials already. He doesn't need basketball. Beef jerky. There's a lot in this. The monster. This is aren't they like beef jerky commercials like where you see like I think that's the other one I think that's Bigfoot oh I'm thinking of Bigfoot hold on hold, hold, wow. on, hold on okay I was I, way off don't worry don't worry I'm gonna Google it and if there's a solid evidence answer that the Loch Ness monster can eat beef jerky then I'll put it right here in the episode we'll find we're gonna find out together I got my creatures messed up wow it's okay it's okay it's okay don't worry about it don't worry about it I should have just said yes let him play basketball. <laughs> It's next question. Okay, fair enough. I'll go to the next question. Okay. Um, you've had the chance to work with a lot of different artists across the board, and you've mentioned some of the amazing talents that you've had the chance to work with. Is there a dream collaboration with a specific talent that you haven't had the chance to work with yet? That's a hard one. That's hard. Sorry, because some, some of the people, the people I'd want to work with, they've passed away. Um, and right. one of them, one of them was uh, Amy Winehouse. Uh, I yeah. mean, like that would I like to drop a track and have her lay down some vocals on it would have been amazing. Um, but if I had to pick today, as I mentioned earlier, right? So like new disco, disco funk, all of that. I right. I think it would be a lot of fun to work with a Purple Disco Machine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That'd be dope. Yeah, that would be fun, and um, I am, I'll be honest, I'm a big fan of Dua Lipa, but I don't even think it would be so much as producing a track for her, even though it would be fun, but to play her tracks, like to play drum set in okay. concert, I think that would be pretty fun. Um, we'll, we'll send it to her. Hey, you know, I don't know the <laughs> agent, but we'll send it online. You never know. She could be watching. Um, there's a lot, but I mean, even... It's funny when you think about it because, like, I've worked with other artists more in the classical realm who it's like, wow, it was so much fun, like, sharing the stage with this person, you know, in the classical sense. But, you know, usually we're playing pre existing music already. It's like not always theirs. But, um, like I said, I can go on with this question. But yeah, Amy and Winehouse was one of those where I was like, <sighs> that would have been, I can kind of picture a little bit now, like, collaboration how that could work and there's a lot of potential on both sides like that could have been oh man you know um, that would have been something good but there's there's so much there's so many great artists out there absolutely there's so many so many so mm -hmm. many talents present past and also in the future so um it's exciting it's an exciting time if you think about it. it is it is okay um and speaking of the artists and uh, and more specifically the composers, and you kind of gave some advice throughout our interview, but I wanted to specifically ask, do you have any crucial advice for inspiring composers? 
Well, I've said it. I think it's going to be the third time I've said it. Slow and steady win the race. Okay. Um, if you want to work in media, a good catalog is crucial. So create. The number one rule, just create. Yeah. Just keep writing. Just keep composing. Compose from what you you want to compose. But at the same time, you know, it was, um, it was told to me one time uh, when I was an undergrad was this saying that you have two ears. One is to listen to you, but to listen to what's around you as well. And I think in media, that's, that's important because you want to listen to your music, making sure you're putting out something good, but you also want to be conscientious of what's happening outside your world because of uh, if there's trends that you're hearing and you're seeing them on television and you've seen them in your films that you watch, you want to be aware of that trend and might want to jump on that trend if it's happening, if you're seeking that work. Like, for example, I think a few years ago, there was like or early 2000s, there was what they call the millennial whoop and like all this music was coming out where it was like, whoa, whoa, whoa everybody's wooing, whoop, right? Yeah. So it was like a trend that was happening, just like the ukulele trend that was happening for a while. And yeah. like, so it's like, you got to be aware of what's going on. Like now we're seeing, what I like is you're hearing a lot more of that Latin music influence coming through. You're hearing a lot more reggaeton. You're hearing, you know, the little, you know, Bad Bunny and J Balvin's and Carol G's, like just little elements are really peeking through. And that's kind of my strength, you know, because I've done a lot of music in specifically in the Latin music realm. But it's, uh, yeah, so I would say build, listen to what you're doing, but also listen to what's going on around you. Very sound advice. So my mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, I have one more question to ask you. And this is a question that I'm asking every single guest on Laser Question Season 3. Uh, I'm making, well, originally I said a mixtape, but I guess now mixtapes are not a thing. It's, you know, I'm getting older or whatever. But I'm making a, a playlist. playlist. Yes, it's a playlist. Thank you. Took the words right out of my mouth. I'm making a playlist this season on Laser Questions. And I'm asking each guest to tell me, what are your top five songs, your top five favorite songs that define your personality? Not now. Gosh, Steven. Five? Mm -hmm. Up to five, if you, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but just some of your favorite songs that define your personality, though. <laughs> oh my gosh. This one's tough. This one is really tough. Don't want to put you on the spot. No, no, I mean, because it, it's, it really is, like, it's a stretch because... I could say, well, I really love like this classical piece, you know, or whatever. And then people are like, what? And they kind of maybe, I don't no, know no, what it's, flow it's, you're going with your it, playlist. It, it, okay. It's not, it's not what, this is just, it's your favorite. Forget everybody else. You know, it's what you appreciate. You know? what gets you okay. Going. okay. I'm a fan of, you know, what? I'm going to pull up my place because I have so many songs in my head right now. I'm going to pull up mine and then I can tell you specifically. So I'm a big fan of Max Richter. He okay. is a, uh, he's a, Composer, but he, he's more into now a film score, film scoring, right? So he's a film composer, but before that, he was just a, a he did a really great rendition of like Vivaldi's Four Seasons, and he kind of like recomposed them, and it was just fantastic. Um, so that's just like anything on that album <laughs> is is great, but uh, specifically, um, it was from. Uh, so I know where I'm going. So hopefully you could edit this part as I'm finding it. Right, we'll see. The viewers will know if I edit this part or not, or if I get really lazy and I don't edit this. We'll find out. We'll find out. Oh my gosh! Where is this song? That is it. This one. Yes. Okay. So Max Richter. Okay. On the nature of daylight. On the nature of daylight. Okay. Yeah. On the nature of daylight. Um, now if I'm going to switch genres, uh, I really like, um, Bonobo. He is uh, another DJ and he had an album come out a few years ago called Black Sands. Black Sands, the song, you know, of the album, that is a great track. Um, I'm a big fan of, like I said, Purple Disco Machine. Yes. 
and uh, fireworks that came out last year. It's just so much fun. Um, that's just kind of like my, you know, it's fun. It's Purple Disco Machine, uh, Moss Kenna and the Knox did that track. Um, Okay, that's three. three. Yes, Man. Two more. Good choices. Good choices. This is hard. Because there's songs that I like, but I don't think that they're they're my personality, but I just like them. That's fine. Songs. That's okay. That's um okay too. Again, I know, but like you're putting it out there for the whole internet, right? This is like, you know, for everyone to to say this, but Whatever, I'm just gonna put it out there. So put again, going back to Amy Amy Winehouse, right? First album, Frank. Um, she has a song on there called "F Me Pumps," and there's a like the first time I heard it, being from Miami, it was like, oh my gosh, this is like almost every girl in Miami. <laughs> well. Um, <yeah. laughs> So it's 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 not a reflection of me, but I thought the the writing like if I go now you're gonna make me geek out on the whole analysis trip of like her chord progressions and how she's moving down in steps like there's a dissension happening with her chord progression and she's actually tearing down girls who are this particular way, and I was like what an epic song it's not it's not one of her big songs but it is just such a strong song that that she put out so I thought that was funny. Um, and so that's four, right? That's four. One more. One more. You got this. One more this song. It's hard. I know. This is what happens with easy questions. Sometimes I get easy questions. Sometimes I get hard ones. Sometimes I just get questions. Who knows? All right. I'm throwing this out there, right? Here's another uh, random one. So, um, Tower of Power, Soul Vaccination. Hey, okay. Um, I know. That's yeah. a great song. That's a great song. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let, drumming it. You know, it's fun. So I, I can imagine. I can imagine. I can't drum for my life, but I can imagine yeah. that must be so much fun. It's it's uh David Garibaldi is my favorite drummer, so he's he's great. Shout out to him. Yeah. Yeah. See, there you go. That wasn't so bad. Not bad, <laughs> oh not bad at all. Not bad at all. That family friends who've never heard of that song before, and they're gonna hear it. They're gonna say, "I never knew that side of you." And it's like it's not me. It's just a good song. The way it's written. <laughs> it's the way it, it, it. That's all it is. The way it's written. You know, it's, it's like, you know what? Don't worry. Uh, when we get to the end of the season, we'll have a full master playlist, so you get to hear um, your tracks and everyone else's uh, song choices. Um, so that's going to be exciting when that gets all said and done. At last, we're here. We're at the end of this These Are Questions interview. Uh, Jessica, it's been a pleasure. Um, before we sign off, is there anything you want to say? Anything you want to promote? Anything you want to say? Any quotes? Last words? This is your time. Your time to shine. The floor is all yours. Well, I just want to say, uh, Stephen, you're great. Thank you for doing this. And I very actually really happy for you. You're on season three of this. I mean, that's that's a great big feat. It takes a lot of time to put this together. So congratulations to you. I'm really grateful to be a part of this. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that if there's any musicians out there or artists or you're considering about pursuing a career in music, definitely check out our website, um, miscomusic.com and set up a, a free call with us and I'd be more than happy to talk with you and just kind of help you through the process. So, you know, if, if you're even just have the slightest doubt of like, can I actually make this happen? Well, I don't think I'm good enough or this or that, like just give us a call. And if you know somebody, refer us. Um, we really, really do have a desire to help the next generation and those who are seasoned musicians already, you know, just maybe taking a new stage in life. Um, we want to see you succeed because the more the day you know we stop creating new music is what is it like it was said in the song the day music died so we don't want music to die no we no. wanted to keep going no we wanted to keep going no one dies we can't have anyone die on no, the show no 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 God, no, no deaths no deaths just questions that's all alrighty alrighty well Jessica it's been a pleasure um, thank you so much for being a part of these are questions and specifically these are questions season three. And to everyone that's watching, you have been watching or listening, since we're also on podcast, you've been watching or listening to These Are Questions Season 3. Until then, have a good night, everyone. Or good morning. I don't know when you're watching. You'll <laughs> be, be watching this at like 9.22 Pacific Standard Time. I don't know. I, I don't know anyone's life. I only know my life. 
and maybe Jessica's life a little bit, just a little bit. That's I learned a little bit you, today. You knew my life in the past hour on the East Coast. On the East Coast.